Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the RLI Power Hour webinar series. Uh, tonight's topic features Enough is Enough, Actionable Solutions for Burnout. Before we get started, I have a couple of quick um, housekeeping notes to run through. Um, everybody's questions will be uh, collected and held to the end of the webinar. Um, everybody entered the webinar in the muted um, in mute mode. Um, so any questions that you have will be collected um, through the Q&A pane, and then we will address those questions at the end. Uh, so if you have questions, please submit them. You don't have to wait until the end to submit your questions. You are more than welcome to submit those um, throughout the entire webinar. Just know that we won't um, begin answering those until the end. And then I also want to let everybody know that uh, this webinar is being recorded. Um, so any questions that are asked will become part of the recording um, and available to everybody after, afterwards. So without any further ado, I would like to turn it over to um, Dr. Bob Pyatt, who is the co-chair for the Power Hour webinar series, and um, he will begin by introducing all the faculty tonight. Thank you, Jen, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining this evening's program. We have a stellar faculty this evening, and I would like to do introductions here for each of them. We'll start off with Dr. Sherry Cannon, MD, FACR, FSAR, and FAAWR. Sherry is a professor and chair in Witten Stanley Endowed Chair of Radiology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, the UAB, Pearsink School of Medicine, and she is the Chief Clinical Officer for the UAB Medicine Ambulatory Practice. She sits on UAB Medicine Joint Operating Coun Leadership Council, which is the senior leadership team for the health system, and she is also a trustee on the board of the physician practice. Dr. Carolyn Benedictus, D. Benedictus, is the fellowship-trained women's imager who specializes in breast imaging in the radiology department at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, UMass, Memorial Medical Center in Worcester, Mass. <clears throat> Dr. D. Benedictus serves as the Director of Radiology Residency Program is, and is the Vice Chair for Education. Dr. D. Benedictus's research interests include teaching effective communication skills to radiologists, diversity and inclusion in radiology, and most recently, healthcare disparities in radiology. She recently was awarded the APDR Jerome Art Grant to develop a curriculum for teaching radiologists about healthcare disparities. Dr. D. Benedictus has served on numerous national radiology committees. Most notably, she is co-chair of the APDR Diversity Committee. Ivan de Quesada II, MD, completed his Diagnostic Radiology Residency and Neuroradiology Fellowship at Emory University, and he is a partner at Radiology Associates of North Texas in Fort Worth, Texas. He is currently the medical director of the Teleradiology Division and was recently elected to the Board of Directors for the Radiology Associates of North Texas. His ACR involvement began in early training and has included service to the Georgia and Texas chapters in multiple positions and projects, as well as being a Rutherford Lanty Levante Fellowship. <clears throat> he is currently on the CSC as chair of the YPS and was recently a Texas counselor. Glory Huang, MD, is a clinical professor of radiology at Stanford Healthcare, Stanford Medicine Children's Health. She specializes in interventional radiology and diagnostic radiology. Her other administrative appointments include the Associate Chair of Clinical Performance Improvement, Medical Informatics Director, and Chair of Radiology IT Operations Committee, and Associate Program Director for the Department of Radiology. It is quite a pleasure to have all this talent on our evening program. We're going to start off tonight with Carolyn D. Benedictus, who will um, open the program, followed by each of the others. And Dr. Uh, De Casada will be our uh, coordinating all the questions and answers uh, later in the program. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to share my slides. I'm excited to be part of this wonderful group of panelists tonight. Oh, let's see here. Do my slide. All right, here we go. 
Okay, so I'm going to start off on the evening with talking about the current statistics on radiologist burnout, um, as well as some current research that the um, ACR Wellbeing Committee, which I'm part of, um, is doing. And then we're also going to end with some resident-focused well-being strategies from the resident well-being um, curriculum that um, we made a few years prior. So let's talk about what's going on with radiologists and burnout. Well, what do we know about burnout? Well, it's a workplace syndrome that is characterized by high emotional exhaustion, high depersonalization, and low sense of personal accomplishment from work. We know that there was burnout before the COVID-19 pandemic due to increasing volumes and other factors in radiology, but we also know that the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated the burnout for multiple reasons, which we'll talk about in the coming slides. In a, recent, um, in a recent study in 2023, nearly 54% of radiologists reported experiencing burnout. And if you look over here on which physicians are the most burned out, you can see that we are around the upper middle part, if not the lower high part of the physicians experiencing burnout. Um, so we are definitely above average for having burnout. We also know that not all groups in radiology are affected equally by burnout. We know that women tend to be affected more by burnout than men and URM and LGBTQ physicians have their own unique risk factors for burnout as well. Four years in a row, AuntMini.com deemed burnout the biggest threat to radiology um, that's out there, compounding already existing radiologist staffing shortages. So what's causing burnout in radiologists? Well, different types of practices have different causes. So in private practice, we're seeing staffing shortages. We're seeing decreasing reimbursement, which necessitates radiologists to read more volume or them not to hire more radiologists into, in order to maintain salaries. We see increasing workloads, both from overutilization of radiology studies, but also staffing shortages. There aren't as many people, so people are having to read more, more volume. And then people are still doing tasks that don't generate revenue, that they're expected to do their same clinical work uh, to generate this high level of revenue, uh, but they're doing other things like tumor boards um, and other administrative tasks that they have to do on top of all their already overloaded clinical schedules. In academics, we see rising clinical volumes just like in private practice. Um, and that's leading to decreasing time to teach and do research. So lots of people in academics say, I went into academics to teach residents and do research. And because the volumes are so high, I'm being pulled off my academic and admin time in order to fill in for people and help with the workload. I might have a resident that day, but I don't feel because of the volumes that I'm able to take the time to teach them that I wish. Um, and so people who went into academics for all those things really aren't finding a lot of satisfaction with their job because of these uh, increasing volumes. And then overall, these staffing sh shortages are causing problems in both private practice and academics. And the real question is, are we training the appropriate number of trainees? Uh, do we need to have more residency spots in the country? That's something controlled centrally by the, the Medicare um, money. And are, are we training enough radiologists? Are there enough radiologists coming out to really handle this new and ever increasing um, workload that we're seeing? So I think that's a really important thing to ask. You know, I think going forward to some solutions is, do we need to train more radiologists so there's less of a staffing shortage without saturating um, the market? And then I think another big common theme is radiologists being asked to do more and more administrative tasks. And um, we'll talk soon about some interviews we did as part of the ACR Wellness Committee on well-being. And, and there is a lot of talk about these administrative tasks um, causing lots of extra work on the radiologists. So this is the Wellbeing 360 project I alluded to, um, and it was undertaken by the ACR Wellbeing Committee. Um, and there were 15 plus hours of interviews with 28 radiologists on unique drivers of burnout and possible solutions. So why? Don't we all know we're burned out? Like, why are we asking questions? Well, we know everyone's burned out, but we wanted to find specific drivers of the burnout and get real feedback from a large group of people to kind of hear the real reasons and how we could mitigate some of the causes of burnout um, and see what is what they suggest. So drivers were unique 
based on practice type career stage, but we still saw some common concerns found throughout the literature, um, as well as the interviews. Workload and volume of imaging studies was the number one driver um, in, in these groups. Um, increased administrative tasks using EMR. Before there were a lot of things like, I didn't have to go in and sign my order for a lidocaine for every procedure. Somebody, you know, brought, did a verbal order or things like that. You had assistance and things like that. Um, you know, someone would, would do your MQSA statistics for you. For example, for me, now we have a click box system that I do instead of someone just taking my PowerScribe um, generated dictation and doing all the, the MQSA for it. So a lot of these things are causing a lot of stress um, and it's limiting time with patients. Um, and things of that nature that sometimes give us the greatest joy in our job. Scheduling changes and lack of control, administrators playing a higher role in telling doctors what to do and not always listening to doctors and they're scheduling procedures too quickly and not giving people enough time to spend with patients, especially when there's, for example, pediatrics or mammo, when we sometimes talk to patients, families, they're not scheduling that in. They're just looking at how, what's the room turnover time? You know, not that there is a patient attached to it sometimes. Isolation, and this is a big one with COVID. You know, we saw a lot more remote workstations in COVID um, and we saw a lot of people, whether at home, feeling very isolated, but also some of us aren't leaving our desks when we're even in the hospital. We're working straight through lunch due to scheduling issues and increasing workload. And so we're not taking breaks. We're not getting out of the reading room or if we're at home, we're not seeing colleagues um, and able to interact with them. Um, getting a lack of feedback on our work from those colleagues because we may not be in the same room with them. We used to like that, hey, Carol, and that's a good call or hey, you know, Jessica, um, you know, you might want to relook at this case that, you know, I, I see where you went wrong, but maybe we can talk about it and help you. And I, and I think that these are things that people miss quite a bit um, about the old way that radiology was structured in the workday. And then boredom and limited growth, um, lack of opportunity of protected time to learn new skills or vary activities during the week due to the clinical demands. Maybe there's somebody that, you know, dabbles in MSK ultrasound and wishes there wasn't time to do more, uh, but because the volume of MRs and everything else is so high, they rarely get to go do that. So I think things like that are, are some of the drivers of, of these problems. So we talked to our participants and asked, what are some solutions that they offered? Um, Easy ways to follow up with patient outcomes and receive feedback on reports. I know peer learning is a great thing for this. I know we use that um, where I am and, and a lot of local hospitals use that where you can just click it into a box and someone gets an email and it gives them some nice feedback, whether it was a great call or, you know, maybe you want to look at this again. Um, patient outcomes, if there can be, you know, dedicated administrative staff that help do follow up on patient outcomes and can give physicians that instead of physicians like me who have a spreadsheet and some weeks we're good about it and some weeks we're not good about getting our follow-up, um, which is really important for our continuing education. Returning to transcriptionists and other administrative help, right? Before, we didn't really have to worry about a lot of things that we now have to worry about. We had transcriptionists transcribing our reports. We weren't fighting with PowerScribe or fighting with um, other dictation modules. Um, and just administrative help for things like for breast, calling pathology or calling critical results in, in the emergency room or answering phones in the emergency room, th things like that. Scaling back when possible to protect well-being. So, you know, they're saying, can we, can we back off some of this volume? Are there ways to add additional radiologists? Does all this volume need to be done? Things like that. Employing more radiologists to allow for more scheduled and protective breaks and time off. You know, we always say we're all scheduled just perfectly. And when one thing goes wrong, there's no um, redundancy in the schedule. And so what ends up happening is if someone, you know, I know, for example, in my department this year, three people went out on unexpected family medical leave at the same time. And we were just, we were working at full capacity and something like that can just spiral. And, and that's when the burnout starts. So maybe creating more redundancy and staffing in order to help this. This could be also with some general radiologists in your pool who can jump into different specialties and help when needed. Curbing unnecessary procedures through clinical decision-making support and other guidelines. So this is where things like ACR Select is great um, to help referring clinicians pick the right study, ACR appropriateness criteria, um, maybe a rad on call who can help talk people through what they need or don't need for imaging uh, to try to curtail both the procedures and the excessive imaging studies that are being done. 
employing teleradiologists to ensure a manageable work list, have the in-person radiologists maybe read the more critical studies that are important um, to have doctor consultation and maybe some of the outpatient studies and things where there is an immediate uh, referring clinician consultation, you can go to, um, you can go um, and, and have those read by teleradiologists. Protect time for volunteering and learning new skills. Support of the leadership regarding use of technology and alternate gaming devices. Um, and you can actually go to the ACR.org in their uh, well-being report to kind of see more of these things. And if you, the ACR is still soliciting additional comments, so please feel free to contact uh, the email address given here if you have some additional comments or suggestions. So we also wanted to talk about the importance of taking breaks since that seemed to be a theme we saw. And there was um, you know, a great um, article on Omni about the healthy radiologist and how to increase your productivity. And they talk about that this is such hard stuff that we're doing and we need a break. Most of us don't, like this person says, I don't get to take a lunch break. To not have a break is not safe, not healthy. To grab, I grab food need at my computer. And I can tell you, I do that too. And I'm sure a lot of us radiologists do do that. Another quote, we work all day in a dark room without windows and that's very depressing. I have no idea what time of day it is, light or dark. And I find it therapeutic to take a lunch break. It's very therapeutic to take breaks. My department was against all of that, but it's absolutely necessary. Another quote, the social expectation is that you don't take a break and that you don't take lunch. It's an unspoken rule. And so these kind of things kind of counter fly in the face of wellness and they're really not great. And I know we have some doctors who I've been working with on the wellness committee who actually are advocating taking walks at noon time, not just a break, go for, even if it's a 10 minute walk, get outside, go for a walk. And it does wonders for your mental health and wonders for your, um, for, for helping ease burnout. And when we talked to our Wellbeing 360 participants, most of them said they didn't take breaks and they were concerned breaks would extend their work day. Um, and that even when they took breaks, sometimes they were afraid they'd be non-enjoyable because they were so worried um, about extending their day and other problems. Also, sometimes their schedule doesn't allow for a break. Sometimes they're scheduled right through the noon hour. Um, you know, this hustle culture. Um, is a problem in US radiology. Get it done, get more done, get it all done. If you have time, you should be doing more. Um, there's been research related to breaks that says it requires a real culture change. And again, that usually starts from the leadership up. So, you know, if your division director says to the administ administrators, you know, hey, that 1215 diag, that needs to stop because we really need to make sure there's a time for, for the radiologist to take a break. Um, so it helps that leadership is on board and leadership runs leads by example and takes a 10 minute break or a half hour break for lunch and doesn't eat at their desk. Um, Dr. Stacey Funt, a radiologist said, after about 80 to 120 minutes, our, our energy levels start to wane and we need to reset and recover. If we ignore this cycle, we activate the sympathetic nervous system to draw stress hormones or use of artificial substances such as caffeine and sugar to sustain our energy. So there, it is, there is science behind, it's better to take breaks than to use all these artificial ways to keep our energy up, that these breaks can be natural ways to re, um, kind of re, revitalize our energy during the day. So we have to remember that everyone is infected and trainees are actually a more vulnerable population to lack of wellness due to the pressures on them in a learning environment. Um, and so it's really important to think about some resident focused well-being strategies. And we have this um, curriculum here that's on the ACR website, which I was lucky enough to be able to help with. Um, and these are some things we, we suggest, attention to scheduling, work intensity and work compression policies and program that encourage optimal resident and faculty well-being, attention to resident and faculty burnout, depression, and substance abuse, encourage reporting of concerns about burnout, depression, substance abuse, suicidal ideation, or potential for violence, provide access to appropriate self-screening tools, provide access to confidential affordable mental health assessments, counseling, and treatment. So you really want to make sure that your scheduling is not contributing to burnout. Overnight rotations tend to be more associated with burnout, as you can see here. So maybe instead of a month of nights, a week of nights, you know, breaking it down, less, less volume of nights or where the nights can be broken up into two shifts and things like that, that always helps. Overnights where it's a night float versus a 24 hour shift has also been shown to be better. Again, going along with our next one, which is hours worked. Um, you know, the more hours you work, the more likely you are to burn out. So this is where really limiting work hours, making sure people get breaks, 
um, and things like that are really important. Um, so I think these are things to really pay attention to in the trainee population. When making residence schedules, you want to look at does the schedule have any elements that will lead to burnout? And if so, have they been minimized? Are we doing a lot of 24 hour call? Are we doing contiguous weeks of night float? Um, things like that. Do we, are we going into weeks without a single day off? Does the resident take into account the different needs of different residents? Um, if not, what type of resident would benefit most from a certain schedule? So, you know, I remember when I was a resident parent, I loved the short float shift I did, which was 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. because it allowed me to be home with my daughter all day, but I would still get home by 2 a.m. and I would at least get five or six hours of sleep, which is probably isn't still enough, but I still was getting some sleep versus the nights. I felt like I, when it was a full night float, eight to eight, I never felt like I saw my child. And when I worked a regular day, I would come home and only have an hour before she went to bed. So, you know, things like that, maybe adding some mixing up the schedule. So there's a little bit for everybody's special situation. So things to consider about the schedule when looking at residents, the less than 80 hour work week, minimizing overnight call and weekends, making sure residents have at least one day off a week, including wellness days so they can attend to personal needs. I know I was fortunate the GME when I was program director um, makes three personal days a year. Plus I used to do wellness lunches where we usually have noon conference and once or twice a month, I make sure there isn't a noon conference so people can just take a walk, meditate, call their mother, uh, go to the post office, things like of that nature. Even just have lunch together as a group of residents. And then non-traditional work hours, as I talked about, can be good, like a 4 to 10 p.m. shift where people can do things during the day that they normally wouldn't be able to on a traditional 8 to 5. Work intensity, um, optimal resident volumes for learning. There's um, a great graph that shows that there's a point where too much volume leads to no learning and not enough volume doesn't lead to enough learning and you want to be in that sweet spot. Uh, the more you see, the more you learn, as I said, only applies to a certain point. At one point, you're just seeing too much and you're just trying to get it done and not really learning from it. Um, and here's kind of that, what we were talking about as the number of films increases above a certain amount, we see clinical performance uh, deteriorate. So it's important to stay in that sweet spot. You can use PACS and EMR dashboards to help residents track and program directors track their volume. You can also collect and review resident volumes biannually. We do that at the one-on-one -on -one meeting every six months and make sure it's in the sweet spot and not above. Um, if residents are exceeding the sweet spot, ask them to re-examine their daily reading habits and decrease their volume. Um, and program directors should be active in monitoring for this. Um, and extra work can be read by other residents, or you can start moonlighting so that there can be some fellow and resident moonlighting if there's volume that needs to be done to keep residents in the sweet spot and not in the over volume uh, area. Work compression, residents spend fewer hours in the hospital, but their clinical workload and educational requirements have not decreased. So because of work hours, we're now compressing more into a smaller time. Um, interesting case conferences can help. Um, you know, it's a way to see to see a lot of cases without having to sort through all the negative ones, right? You're reading a lot of cases, some are negative. Interesting case conference can show all these interesting cases in a nice one hour period to allow for the for some of the time lost seeing cases with work hour restrictions. Daily case rounds are another thing. And an interesting case database, I know we have this in RED where they can just look it up in their free time. All these can be ways of supplementing the, the compressed work schedule due to work duty hours. Policies and programs that encourage optimal well-being, training leave policies and sick time and personal days. I know the ABR is a great uh, policy that has helped program directors with this. Wellness days, wellness lunches, meditation and mindfulness. I know we've done that in some of our um, some of our attendings who like meditation and mindfulness will do this at the first 10 minutes of their conference at noon even. Peer support groups, for example, women in radiology and other affinity groups. Social events, happy hours, dinners, escape rooms, yoga, hiking, skiing, all these are great to be with your colleagues outside of the reading room. And appreciation and acknowledgement, appreciation ice cream, appreciation lunches, just sending emails and saying thank you. A lot of hospitals have, you know, these electronic ways of doing it where you can send them a star or something like that. And those are all great ways to help acknowledge people. Um, and if they're acknowledged, sometimes it helps with burnout. And that is it for me. Good evening. Uh, thank you and appreciate that, uh, Dr. De Benedictus. Let me. All right, so I think it's important to state at the outset that burnout is a system issue and that some of the 
things we talk about is, as action items are really at the individual level that really doesn't address the core of burnout, but there are still things we can do to help. Um, what I specifically want to talk about is the role of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and specifically around the discussion of development of a culture. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the data space, but just to review quickly, and this is a source from the AAMC uh, Faculty Engagement Survey. It's 13 institutions, about 7,500 faculty, so fairly robust. Now, limitation is it is pre-COVID data, 2016 to 18. And what we see across different areas, and, and what we're looking at here is, is green or individuals who enjoy work. Everything above green, yellow to orange to red are stages of burnout. So as we look at the type of clinical care across these academic uh, medical faculty, across ranks and across gender and race, we see some trends. One, that faculty who provide patient care are at a little bit higher risk as are mid-level faculty members. And then as we look over here, we see that women are at risk. Interestingly, this data doesn't differentiate between underrepresented versus non-underrepresented, which is frankly a departure from most data that we know. And in fact, a publication that just came out, uh, not in time for these slides, from Dr. Joxie, actually uh, one of our ACR members, uh, chair of radiation oncology at Emory, and JAMA, it was a survey of 800 people, and it demonstrated there is a clear uh, disproportionate effect of burnout on particular groups of people. And, and, and really, it's, it's all of the underrepresented groups, communities of color, gender diverse, LGBTQA+, as well as women. And I want to share this article from Dr. De Benedictus, which is a nice opinion piece, really talking about this, this space, is those who are underrepresented are disadvantaged, and this could lead to stress on the job um, because of macro and microaggressions, overt discrimination, and really unfavorable work conditions. So what we're talking about to help mitigate this is intentional inclusivity. And what we mean by this is really changing the norm. And we'll take gender as one single example. In radiology, with 25% of radiologists and trainees as women, this is kind of our norm. But we really need to change it up so that it is no longer the norm. And, and what we're really talking about here is a state of belonging. So individuals feel like they belong in their department or their practice. And the important piece of this, which is sometimes forgotten, is, is this is the intersection of inclusion, diversity, and equity. And it's important that those things are in balance. And this is a concept that's widely seen across uh, HR organizations. An example being, if you recruit for diversity in a situation where you don't have an inclusive culture, you'll have a retention problem. So we really need to be thoughtful about how we do that. And, and how do we do that? Well, I firmly believe this begins at the top with leadership. You must operationalize equity with inclusion. And really only then can you recruit for diversity and create that belonging, which can be a strong mitigate for burnout. Now, we know that simply by having a department chair that is a woman you can impact things. And this is an interesting thesis done out of Princeton, non-STEM cell departments. I think it was across accounting, political science, and economics, demonstrating that just by having a female department chair, um, it reduced gender gaps in publications. Uh, there was a improved promotion for women. And importantly, there was a decreased gender gap simply by having a woman leader. And one of the programs that I'm particularly proud of is a, a uh, partnership between SCARD, which is the Society of Chairs and Academic Radiology Departments, which I'm a member of, and GE Healthcare. And this program is to specifically develop women who will go on to become department chairs. Because we know the number of women members in SCARD was at the low of about 5% in the 2000s, and now we're up at about 22%. We started our program right about here. So we're moving in the right direction, 
but we still have a ways to go. But it's really this leadership at the top that will help with diversity. And this is only an example of gender. This is not even touching on race, ethnicity, and either other definitions of diversity. But the leaders must be inclusive. And that means they must have a visible, they walk the walk, role model diversity with humility and an open awareness and acceptance of bias and a real genuine curiosity about others and having a cultural intelligence across these diverse groups and um, enabling effective collaboration across these groups. Leaders must have a commitment to role model this. And for example, as a practice leader, how do you run a meeting? Does everyone have a voice at the table, even perhaps the introverts? And our discussions around faculty or practice members, are they habituated to be inclusive as far as the, the, uh, the makeup, say, of committees? Um, is there a reflection in the practice or the department that diversity is important? Is there a committee? Is there a leader, a champion, a vice chair, or a director? And importantly, and what is often lacking, is lack of resourcing these leaders. We have to be very careful of tokenism and minority taxes. That is, don't make the women serve in all the committees because it makes their lives more challenging. Equally more challenging is the intersectionality of gender and race. So we need to be careful about that. And as leaders, we must demonstrate allyship to support these individuals and sponsorship to make sure that they move forward. And that means addressing our own biases. So whatever you are the leader of or will become, whether it's a committee, a practice, a department, these are all things that you can take on. Really important in this space is transitioning from a bystander to upstander. If you see events of microaggression or harassment, that is truly a teachable moment. And as a leader, we can't let that moment go by. And there are different ways to intervene beyond just the uncomfortable laugh. And while we've all had fun with the generational differences, and I particularly enjoy this one, um, we need to realize that generational gaps are an issue right now. And I would argue they are the source of more friction in my department than just about anything else. So we need to work through those issues. And we need to address harassment, which means we must understand and accept that it is occurring. And in fact, in one study, it demonstrates approximately 75% of women in, in medicine have at some point uh, been sexually harassed. So as we shift from leadership to operationalize equity and inclusion, what we're really talking about here are policies and processes throughout the organization, whether an academic department, a practice, or a hospital. Do we have term limits for leadership positions? Do we embrace part-time, which is very important, and understanding that many individuals more commonly women go home from a full-time job to take care of the family. So we need to support working from home while balancing the isolation that that may uh, result in. It is a balance. We absolutely need to support paid family leave. This is not maternal leave, but this is family leave. And as Dr. D. Benedictus mentioned, I'm really proud of the stance that both SCARD and ABR have taken in this and, and really to lead with these inclusive policies. Are we reviewing our salaries? I, I firmly believe in not negotiating for salary because once there are negotiations, that's when bias takes place. For academic practice, are we looking at our promotions and our women and women of color promoted at the same rate as their men counterparts? Looking at our committee composition, and do we support our young mothers with lactation facilities? And is this important to us? Yeah, it is important. At the end of a typical physician practice, men are making in total $2 million more than their female counterparts. So we once and for all need to address this salary gap. And it's remarkable to me the lack of understanding in this space. Now, while this is a little bit dated, I think this was from 2018, 
This was a Texas publication in response to a Wall Street Journal article about the wage gap for physicians, um, typically, uh, specifically that women make about 64% of their male counterparts. This was called Big and Bright Ideas. Ask for individuals to send in ideas, how do we address this? Here's one comment that stood out. Yes, there is a pay gap. Female physicians do not work as hard and do not see as many patients as their male physician counterparts. This is because they choose to, or they simply don't want to be rushed or they don't want to work the long hours. Most of the time their priority is something else, family, social, whatever. Nothing needs to be done about this unless female physicians actually want to work harder and put in the hours. If not, they should be paid less, that's fair. So clearly we have a ways to go. This is a wonderful article from a, a group of individuals really talking about these uh, pay gaps, expired excuses, which I love, and solutions for change. What else do we do? Dr. D. Benedictus already mentioned, and I love this, the hustle, hustle culture. Are individuals taking vacation as appropriate? Is it an inclusive environment to support that? Are we developing our faculty and our practice members with implicit bias training? What do our websites look like? Are they inclusive with policy and photos? This is really interesting that was published uh, last year. It demonstrated that 42% of websites of academic departments use the term chairman. However, you don't want to create what's called counterfeit diversity. You don't want to create a website that's not truly reflective of the culture. That is, you strategically select photos that maybe represent diversity that isn't actually true. So that's a concern too. We have to be sincere and genuine. And interesting, the diversity innovation paradox in science, which states, Diversity does breed innovation, yet underrepresented groups that diversify organizations actually have less successful careers within those organizations. Again, speaking to if you recruit for diversity but don't have that inclusive environment, you will fail. So really only when all these get into place can we talk about that recruitment and what that looks for. Leadership needs to charge the committee. We need to de-bias our job postings, change the default. I share that up until a few years ago, all of our default postings actually said full-time position, clearly excluding an, an entire group of potential radiologists who are interested in part-time work. We need to avoid male gendered language and we need to advertise differently. When I trained, Everybody posted in the back of journals. We no longer do that and shouldn't. We also need to consider alternative postings. We all know AAWR, but what about the Association of Black Women Physicians as just one example? We need to broaden the candidate pool and know that women and men engage differently with recruiting. And we need to go beyond our usual networks. Our selections committees, of course, need to be diverse, and we must train them for implicit bias, and not in just the check the box way, but in a truly educational format. Interviews should be structured so that the same questions are asked of differing types of individuals, and we should learn about candidates before they arrive and tail tailor the interviews accordingly to their needs. So once we have all that in place, then we can execute as leaders and hopefully create an inclusive environment that is diverse and really goes as a strong mitigant against burnout. So with that, I will end and turn it over to Dr. Wong. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cannon. And let me go ahead and share my screen. So I'm going to round out this group of talks with a discussion on moral injury. And let's see. So I've, I was only introduced to the concept of moral injury in the past year and, and the term really resonated with me. And the, the question arose of why in the um, environment of when which people are talking about burnout has the term moral injury really taken hold in the physician community as a way of discussing 
the concept of burnout. Uh, so looking back at the history of it, turns out that the term moral injury went viral back in 2018. This is like pre-COVID times, thanks to a couple of physicians um, named Wendy Dean and Simon Talbot. They felt that burnout was really not an adequate word to describe what physicians in distress were experiencing on the front lines. And so they published a StatDX article. They actually apparently farmed this out to various journals who refused to publish. So they, they were able to publish in StatDX an article proposing that this state that the physicians were experiencing be called moral injury instead of burnout. So before this, moral injury was used to describe the psychological injury that soldiers experienced on the battlefield, which could lead to PTSD. And the authors believed from personal experience and from talking to their colleagues, that the physician experience of working in a chronic state of moral distress, where their values were out of alignment from what they were being asked to do, was eroding their well-being, similar to what soldiers were experiencing. Their hypothesis was that physicians develop an identity through years of sacrificing many aspects of their lives in service of patient care, um, which includes like lost sleep, lost years of young adulthood, huge opportunity costs to become a physician. And then when these physicians are out in practice and find themselves struggling in the clinic, they, they found that it's not because these physicians lack resilience, since physicians are masters of resilience through their years of training, but rather because they experience a disconnect between their moral mission as physicians, what they train to do, and what the system requires of them. As they stated in a follow-up publication in 2019, moral injury occurs when we perpetrate, bear witness to, or fail to prevent an act that transgresses our deeply held moral beliefs. Every time we are forced to make a decision that contravenes our patient's best interests, we feel a sting of moral injustice. Over time, these repetitive insults amass into moral injury. The difference between burnout and moral injury is important because using different terminology reframes the problem and the solutions. Burnout suggests that the problem resides within the individual who is in some way deficient. So what these authors basically did was they took a group of physicians who we're really, really, really trained to believing, you know, we're resilient, maybe we're not burnout, we're too resilient to burn out and had them realize, you know what, there is something going on and that something is moral injury. Like you are at the maximum peak of resilience, but there, there is still too much to handle. And this actually took hold in the medical community to the point where the British Medical Association did a study from 2019 to 2021 and published in 2021, the results of a survey of um, physicians in the UK and what they found um, was that um, they were what they found in, in their publication was that they could actually parse things even more finely. And they found that there is something called moral distress. So they found that moral distress is the psychological unease professionals feel when they know what is ethically correct, but they can't take that action due to misalignment with their institutional requirements. Moral injury is the longer term psychological harm that results after sustaining moral distress leads, after sustained moral distress leads to impaired physician function. So it's hard to control how individuals will experience the problems, which is the moral injury, but it is possible to address those sources of chronic moral distress. According to the British Medical Association, burnout different, differs from moral distress or moral injury because burnout could result from stress even without a moral component, um, but moral injury does have that moral component. So does it really matter if we're using the term moral injury versus burnout to describe physician distress? I think the distinction is important mainly if it's gonna help physicians and organizations to direct who is responsible for correcting the problem. Some believe or, or emphasize that burnout represents factors that an individual can improve through exercises to improve resilience and well-being, such as self-care, self-forgiveness, reflection, and allowing yourself time to rest, which are all great things um, and important, but moral injury reflects how the system is failing to support individuals in their ability to work within their moral standards, which really is something that has to be corrected at an organizational level. So here are some examples um, from, of moral injury in the healthcare setting. 
One is, and something that I've actually been fighting a lot over the last few weeks, insurance preauthorization process and handling care denials, like being worried about a cancer patient needing a treatment and not being able to get that through in a timely fashion. EHR documentation demands, which are taking away patient focus. This is the classic um, physician and clinic staring at the screen instead of actually looking at the patient who's trying to get talk to them and, and, and communicate their issues. Withholding unwelcome but necessary advice to patients because of fear of reducing patient satisfaction score. So this could involve lifestyle factors. This could involve um, substance abuse, opioid use, um, not, not being able to engage with that because of fear of satisfaction scores affecting your practice. Being asked to do more work than can safely be done. Uh, this is, as we saw, something that is, uh, resonates greatly within radiology. Inadequate resources to provide care to suitable professional standards. We saw this a lot over the past few years with COVID and still actually are experiencing supply chain issues of common drugs and devices that are affecting our ability to provide care to our patients in the way that we want. Witnessing acceptance by the organization of poor standards of care and also um, end of life care decisions and how those are handled by an organization. So what does that feel like? What does moral injury fear like, feel like? It feels like loneliness, disempowerment, and being out of control. What does it look like? Um, the result of moral injury is basically what a bad doctor would look like. Um, disengagement, depersonalization, disruption. And I imagine that even if you are not experiencing moral injury or burnout at this time, you almost certainly have encountered clinical colleagues who show signs of it. For example, some of the highest rates can be found in the ED setting. Moral injury manifests um, in relationship disrupting behaviors that ultimately affect the work environment, work relationships and patient care. And it also drives a relatively high suicide rate within the medical profession. So how can leaders help? First, um, if we agree that the early, early literature on burnout actually overlaps with the concept of moral injury, then as with burnout, it's very clear that leaders and particularly the leaders to which a physician directly reports play a very strong role in whether a physician experiences burnout. In this survey um, by Tate Shanafel in the Mayo Clinic, the authors found that in physicians with burnout, most rated their leaders unfavorably on all 12 leadership qualities. These are charts from that same paper um, that demonstrate how the leadership score with high being better is inversely correlated with physician emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and burnout and is positively correlated with satisfaction with the organization and with um, the department. Other suggestions for how to fix the problem. The British Medical Association survey from 2021 suggested the following measures, which include have adequate funding and resourcing, increase staffing, empower doctors, develop an open and sharing workplace culture, which sounded an awful lot in the description, like a culture of safety, allowing individuals to speak up when they saw concerns, provide support for employees, and streamline bureaucracy. I, I looked at this list, and I have to admit that of these options, the most readily accessible solutions, which would not require access to a large amount of capital, seem to be the last Four options. Um, I, I think everyone, it's, it's clear that people want more staffing, and that seems to be the biggest fight that we have. But the last four are still actionable items. For example, physician empowerment is a behavior that requires some process changes, but is quite actionable. Developing a culture that allows those with co concerns to speak up is a cultural phenomenon that can be modeled through leadership behavior. Providing support for employees may require some investment, but could be pursued creatively, probably in a cost-neutral fashion. And streamlining bureaucracy 
demonstrates respect for individuals and their time and helps demonstrate the primacy of patients. And in the end could also be cost neutral if it results in greater efficiency. Wendy Dean, after that StatDX article, started a podcast. So if you look up podcasts um, on, on moral injury, you'll actually find that she and Simon Talbot actually have a whole podcast on that. And she, they also wrote a book called If I Betray These Words, which is replete with examples of situations of physicians um, with, who experience moral injury. One thing that struck me about um, the recurring, about these um, instances of moral injury was the lack of trust between these physicians and their organizational leaders. These physicians felt betrayed by organizational leadership through actions such as letting physicians go and replacing them with less trained staff or pressuring them on productivity and documentation without attention to the quality of patient care. Um, these physicians did not feel that leaders trusted physicians who raised concerns to be acting in good faith and in the best interest of both the patients and the organizations. So what would be the opposite behavior of that? Stephen Covey Jr. in his book, The Speed of Trust, suggests that building and modeling trust creates efficiency within an organization. And he notes that there are two elements to being trustworthy. One is character, which is demonstrated by integrity and intention. And the second is competency, which is demonstrated through capabilities and delivering results. Leaders need to demonstrate character and competency and should display trust to those who, who they lead who model the same. The other way that leaders can lead by example is through modeling kindness. As described in an article in the Harvard Business Review, this manifests in the five following ways. One is to include, which is through respect and, and creating a space of psychological safety. The second is to inform or providing transparency, making people understand, allowing people to understand decision-making. The third is to inquire, solicit input if, 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 those, if reports um, don't agree with something, try to understand what, what, what is their concern? Um, is there something that is not being explained well? Or is there so something that you were blind to that could be fixed? The fourth is to develop, which is to nurture the professional development in the various ways that individuals need it um, in their careers. And finally, the fifth is to recognize or to show authentic appreciation and gratitude. Gratitude is one of those things that it's the gift that keeps on giving. It's the gift that gives to the individual um, a, a well-studied wellness um, intervention is actually to have people journal on gratitude. And I think gratitude is something that when you're in, in the busy role of being a physician can be sometimes hard to remember, but um, something that if modeled by leaders can be so helpful and, and, it's, and can then rub off on everyone in the organization. And finally, um, how can individuals engage with leaders? At the end of the day, it's all about reciprocity. So if a leader has earned your trust and has shown kindness, it would be most helpful if an individual did the same and reciprocated with trust and kindness or even led with trust and kindness. Um, if, even if you're not nominally a leader in an organization, you can lead in these aspects. Another is to assume good intent. And that seems to be one of the themes um, of, of moral injury is there, there, se there seems to be a villain and, and, and a good guy. And, and that is, and sometimes you actually are in, in systems that truly are not, not well intended for patient care, but sometimes they are, and they may just not be seeing all the aspects of impact on patient care. So by assume, approaching leaders with the assumption that the leaders intend well until they prove otherwise to you, you can seek to understand why the system evolved to be the way that it is. And it opens the door to educate leaders on the impact of the system on you as a provider, on your colleagues and on patients. Another, thing, another way to engage with leaders I've seen is sometimes you are pretty darn set that 
there is a solution. And so you go with a solution and to hear no to the solution sounds like no to acknowledging the problem. But in fact, there are ways to step it back to the problem where if the solution, which is you need to hire more people is not acceptable at that time with that leader, there may be other things that you can do where you say, well, really the problem is that there are times when the volume of work feels overwhelming to me and I feel rushed, which is showing some vulner personal vulnerabilities. Like I am experiencing this and then working that problem. And working that problem may not necessarily mean you hire more people. There may be other ways to solve the problem of an individual feeling that the volume of work is getting too much and you're feeling rushed and you feel like that's compromising patient safety. So um, truly at the end, um, I think the solutions I have for moral, I'm offering for moral injury are trust, kindness, and reciprocity. Um, those are pretty simplistic, but are actually, when you get down to the details, pretty hard to execute. And I think it's like everything that we do um, it involves practice. So I hope that um, at the end of the day, all, all of you who are listening, and I see many of my friends in the audience, take the opportunity to practice these, um, these acts and see what that can do for your organization. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to move on to the all faculty Q&A. Um, I'd like to invite the faculty to turn on their camera. Dr. De Casada, do you want to take over? Thanks so much. I think I learned quite a bit just watching all of these presentations. There's a there's a lot out there that I hadn't really heard about. So so thank you everybody for giving up your time this evening to uh, to present all of this. Um, to begin with, I think that uh, there is you know one one thing that that seems to be an overarching uh, umbrella concern that has come up uh, even even by someone asking during this presentation. I mean, uh, one of the, the biggest challenges that seems to, to link all of these folks together is this idea of support. You know, where does support come from? Does it come from your, your own practice? Does it come from your leadership? Does it come from administrators in the, in the larger healthcare facility maybe you're serving? Um, so I think that would be a nice icebreaker just to talk about perhaps one specific anecdote or a situation uh, that, that might be personal to you or, or something that dealt with, you know, burnout in your department uh, and how you found support, you know, for that kind of thing, whether it's an initiative or finding time to help them uh, weather that issue. We can start just, I guess, going down the line, I guess, let's see, um, Gloria was, I think, the last one presenting. Why don't we start with you? Um, so examples of support in our department, I would say, I'm trying to think of specific examples. Again, we try to model like general supportive behavior. We've done the things that one ought to do. We have a well-being committee. Um, Tate Shanafelt is at Stanford. We actually survey our, our physicians pretty regularly. Um, but I, I think one way that as, as in performance improvement, a lot of times like you're, you're there to improve efficiency of practice. And a good part of that is helping radiologists do their best within, within, the, um, within, the, within the limits that one has when practice. And one example of a recent initiative that we had was something called Hubbles in the Shoes. Um, and so our well-being committee was asked to just go out to each division and bring in the things, the pebbles in the shoes that makes every, that brings down every individual, makes people feel like they're not working at their best, that makes their day less than the brightest, shiniest day of their lives and bring them to me. 
uh, and my, to my committee, the performance improvement committee, so that we could start working them. And as someone who is also supporting our department in IT operations, I was chagrined and delighted to see that a lot of those were technical. And so some of those technical things could be solved quickly. So on the feasibility impact scale, I could do some high feasibility, high impact stuff quickly. And that was great. And then there are other things that were like going to take a lot more resources, lower feasibility, but high impact. Those we put on project timelines and, and worked with leadership in IT to get the support for that. And then those that were low feasibility, low impact, the important thing was then to message to the group or individual who brought that up, hey, um, this is actually a really heavy lift right now. So I know this is real to you. What can we do to mitigate the effect of this on you in the time being, but we don't have the resources to work this problem at this time? Or we can do a pilot, but I'm not sure this is going to work. And, and so that, I think the Pebbles in the Shoes program, that, that's the most um, recent example I can think of how, how we've been trying to um, help our department members. I like that. No, I like that answer, the Pebbles in the Shoes thing. I mean, we, we talk about friction uh in our group and 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 friction is something that does increase burnout and 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 you're right it is a huge part of that so i'm i'm not surprised <laughs> that that came up um what about you sherry i mean you're you know you're at the head of your department so i'm sure you have to walk a pretty tough uh tightrope between some of these extrinsic uh pressures but also you know looking out for your folks uh, within i mean what are some things that that you might be able to share in terms of a specific uh, anecdote or, or situation? Yeah, I, I see as my role really twofold. One, on an institution level, again, uh, recognizing that burnout is a system issue. And so my role is to really address it at that higher level so that our institutional leaders are aware and understand how challenging it is and give them ideas for solutions. So I think that that's that's one hat I wear. The other one is inward focus to the department. And I guess my anecdote is um, one, thing, one thing I've seen time and again is the evolution of leaders going into burnout. And I think our leaders are really at great risk because they themselves are busy, have uh, less time and, are, and, and have more expectations. I expect a lot of my leaders. And so I have seen them transition to burnout. And it's very interesting. You see a very high functioning leader. And, and I love Gloria's discussion about it's just, it, they become a disruptive physician. They become a bad doctor, a bad leader and a bad doctor. And, they're, and they may be subtly disruptive, but it's different. And what's really challenging is once they get to that point, it's really hard to recover them. And um, and they're very much in denial. Again, all attributes of burnout. So we really, as soon as now I see a sign of that, I try to intervene. And, and one of the earliest signs that I've noticed is leaders who are normally very effective and, and pretty even keeled, everything is a disaster. I mean, they're, they fly into your office with their hair on fire all the time. And historically, they weren't that way. To me, that is one of the earliest signs of, um, you know what, they're stepping onto that side of burnout. And, and it's it's hard to pull them off that ledge. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, the systems issue is definitely something to keep in mind. And I, I remember you mentioned that during your presentation, because, I mean, that goes back to the whole just culture, you know, mindset that that we need to try and tackle and an environmental, a system issue rather rather than pointed individuals uh, as the weakness. Um, so, uh, Carolyn, did you have something specific uh, that you were thinking of uh, you wanted to share as well? Sure. So, mine's from a different point of view. All of my wellness initiatives have been with trainees. And I think one of the big things is if leadership is really open, I think leadership needs to listen. And I think leadership needs to really be receptive and also to change over time with different groups needs. So, you know, as a residency program director, we dealt with wellness for many years and there wasn't great wellness many years ago. And we brought it around to now, you know, the last survey, we were the second happiest residency in the in the hospital, I, I can't top derm. I just can't. There's nothing I can do. I can't make this dermatology. So <laughs> I take second as the best I can do. Um, and, you know, I think it's an evolution. You have to listen to what they want. And so initially, I there were some things of like, 
there were certain rotations where people would get held late because attendings would leave for extended periods of time and and we curbed that and then it was we want to do more stuff together as a residency so we did a lot of that then that scaled back and they said honestly dr d we don't want to do all this outside stuff our families are priorities we'd rather have that hour you know wellness lunch twice a month and we'd like some mentoring, you know? So I think a lot of it is really actively listening and, and trying to do what you, you can. And also, you know, making it a priority, you know, I really stood up for the trainees saying, no, we can't staff all these places. We don't have enough trainees and instead fought for an expansion of the residency. And now we're gonna have an expansion of the residency and now they can staff more places. And I think, I think you really have to stand up for, if you're a chair, a division director, a program director, for the people that report to you and, and you have to say no. You have to say, no, we can't staff that. No, we can't take that on. And if it's really important to the people that need those things, they'll fund you for those things. Show them that you need those things. And no, it's never gonna be perfect. Trust me, it's a real world. I probably could have used double the number of residents I ended up getting, but it's it's a start. And so um, I, think, I think those are some really important things. No, I think that's a great answer. And, and if you don't mind me, uh, keeping you in the spotlight here, because we did have a couple questions uh, from folks that were submitted ahead of time that were specific to training. And it's like something that that we talked about at the YPS this year and, and last year, the, the expanding residencies is a huge thing, uh, because I think part of this staffing shortage, uh, and that was something that that we talked about um, you know, that that's really one big way that that needs to be handled. So so from your perspective, um, you know, you mentioned a specific tackling burnout among trainees, but but how do you achieve reasonable workload during these staffing shortages? I mean, I mean, you said just say no, but but uh, you know how it is. I mean, sometimes a system has decided to take on a new hospital, or the the residents, for example, um, are being asked to do more call or independent call or some other thing, and. You know how how are are there specific challenges you're you're you've had to deal with recently? Yeah, you know we have to deal with an overwhelmed ED all the time, and um, one way we've done it is we've made the residents take some of the additional shifts as call shifts, but then we've made the other half moonlighting shifts. Um, and so they uh, and and yes, they will always have to be filled, but we found that that made it more palatable to residents. Then now we need to cover the ED twenty four seven. Just here's all these extra call shifts. Hey guys, we got to cover the ED 24 seven. Here's what we're going to do. You know, hope in X number of years when our full complement of new residents are here, these none of this will be moonlighting. But for now, everyone takes an extra shift a month. And then there will be, I forget how many, 10 shifts up for grabs that need to be covered, but you'll get paid extra for. And we've done that too when we've had residents. At the beginning of my tenure as PD, we had some classes that were missing a resident due to transfers, due to just leaving medicine, things like that. And we didn't make people take their call. We did it as moonlighting. And actually there have been some great GME papers um, that have said with parental leave and things like that, when you need people to cover call, if it's compensated versus just you're doing it, it, it there's a much different feel about it. And so I, I think I think if you do need to take something on that is more than you can handle, that's one way of doing it. And it doesn't all need to be compensated. As you saw, we said, hey guys, we can't compensate at all. You know, you're gonna have to take a little more, but we understand it would be like a huge shock to take it all on. So we'll kind of do it that way. And then you can phase it out as you can get more staffing to appropriately staff. And, and it works well with trainees. I'm never gonna say, I know that this will work with the department <laughs> because that's a whole different thing. But but that's worked with us for things like parental leave and having to take on new tasks. I think that does work for departments. Uh, you know, everyone's struggling with recruiting right now. And so many departments are understaffed and and we can take dollars that we should be going for faculty salaries and, and divide that up into the slang term is hazard pay, which my HR absolutely hates me using. Um, I think the formal is, is extra duty. I can't remember what it's called. So to recognize that, right, this is going above and beyond. It's for a limited period of time. I'm very specific about that. Um, but it does frame it in a much different way. And it, it, it is one way to show appreciation. Nice. I'm glad you jumped in, Sherry, because you were the next one I was going to ask about that, you know, coming from, I mean, I when I was in training, um, I would talk to uh, our chair 
quite a bit about some of these issues that that we dealt with as residents of fellows and and it, it's tough you know they'd be building a brand new hospital tower uh and then i'm thinking well you know who's going to sit at that magnet or who's going to be you know reading out all of these new cases coming through and and unfortunately i think radiology is sometimes an afterthought even though we're at the center of a lot of that care uh so you know i mean you already mentioned a little bit about you know from your perspective but have you found that there is any barrier to implementing that kind of um for lack of a better term uh hazard pay or do you find that people are pretty welcome to that given that there are very real shortages um i i've been successful in in implementing these programs um again th these are dollars that would otherwise go to faculty salaries and um and I think another thing that we've invested in, which has been also really productive, is additional support, for example, on the weekends. So offering internal moonlighting for trainees to be an extra trainee on the weekend to support the faculty so they can review the studies and predictate. Um, that's kind of a win-win. And, and what's interesting is, is one of our better subscribed uh, internal moonlighting is is for ultrasound because the residents actually appreciate getting more experience in ultrasound because that's an area where they feel like they probably don't get to do quite as many studies. And so it's kind of been a win-win. So I, I think, again, that's the role of the chair is to advocate for these things, depending on how your funds flow and practices set up um, to support your faculty. Because in the end, that investment is well worth it um, for the retention of the individuals you have. Um, but, and Gloria, did you have anything you wanted to contribute to that one? I totally agree with everything that Carolyn and Sherry say. I, I, I'm trying to think if if there were examples in our department of um, hazard pay. I I'm not aware of it, but it's it is an idea that I think has great merit. Um, I, I, I think the closest we have is um, for a faculty general call, um, rather than just say we have X number of people and that number varies and you all just have to cover the call, actually defining like based on your division and your call responsibilities, you have X number of days of call, oh, there are these excess days, those are moonlighting opportunities for faculty. And likewise, for interventional radiology, we, we've piloted the ability to trade away calls so that if for whatever reason it's not, um, you, you can't take call and there are young, some faculty who are very eager to get a little extra pay and are happy to take extra call, allowing people to do call swaps um, and basically pay, uh, pay other faculty to take their call. I think for programs like this, it's really important to have transparency and really clear benchmarks and triggers. At what point is the hazard pay triggered? And at what point does it get pulled back? And, and consistency across the department, because when you do these one-off deals, that's when you're gonna get into a little bit of trouble. So I think it's really important to be very open about whatever the policy and process is for that. I love it. It's a good, it's a good discussion. And it sounds like everyone has a lot of important points, things that they've dealt with personally. So one of the questions that came up, and this is something that I think uh, is dealt with in, in academics and private practice, at, at least on a similar level of, of import, which is balancing productivity and accuracy. Um, we don't have metrics for accuracy. You know, how do you measure what is a quality report? And, and so, you know, in spite of not having that um, ultimate grail of, of quality, um, we use other surrogate measures. Uh, and so how do you in your department, you know, you're having increased productivity. I know you are, you know, because we see it everywhere. The volumes keep going up. We have to match it. You know, we're running faster on the treadmill. Internally, what are things that you've been doing to, to try and, whether it's easing the pressure on the productivity part, or looking at the accuracy to make sure that even if people are getting the work done, that they're doing it safely. Whoever wants to start with that one, please feel free to jump in. Oh, I, I know I in see our you department. Un, un, 
I know in our department and based on the feedback we've gotten from our annual referring provider survey, um, it's very clear that we value the quality of our interpretation reports. That is no, number one, that is a cherished value at Stanford. And that is something that we, do, we don't want to let go. That is what people number one say about Stanford is collegial consultants with high skill. We don't want them to think that we are er eroding on skill because that we, we, we are um, we are expensive in the area and what we offer is skill. And so um, and so how do you balance that with productivity? Um, I think we, what we don't ever want a faculty member to feel is rushed. And what I've noticed divisions doing is like everywhere, it's very natural that there is a range of speed a faculty, and so when divisions do it well, they um, actually they accommodate that. They they it's a trusting relationship. They know yes, some of us are slower, but we teach more, and so others who just value speed, you guys do that. And at the end of the day, when you look at the bonuses, there's a modest but not zero um, increase in bonus if you are more productive. So it's you, you don't live or die by your RVUs, but it's acknowledged in a small way by our department. So there's a group RVU and that factors in by division and there's a little component of individual RVU also. And I think rec even rec non-financial recognition by leadership for people who, who seem to be hitting the marks in terms of both quality and productivity make a huge difference too. And, and then uh, and then at the end of the day, that. offering if um, offering ways to make the work more efficient. Like if there's unnecessary work happening in the report generation, can we all agree to scale that back or introduce um, yes. other technologies that improve the efficiency of work? Perfect. I see both both of you, uh, Carolyn and Sherry, unmuted. Uh, Sherry, do you want to go first? I think how you approach RVUs in, in your culture is important. And, and we, I, I think Gloria's comment was important. We don't lead with RVUs. I mean, we frame it that we respond to RVUs. We don't generate RVUs. And, and I think when you lead with RVUs, you, you get into this hamster wheel mentality, and then you get these really dysfunctional behaviors, cherry picking, et cetera. So while we provide that data, like Glory mentioned, it's a small incentive. And I think this is managed well on a local level. Our section chiefs are good about recognizing how individuals contribute to the tripartite mission across the section, not across the individuals, and also understand the individual's uh, comfortable speed. And, and, and really when, and we have certain triggers for recruiting, and that to me is really the driver for RVUs. And, and I look to the section chiefs to say, hey, it's time, We're, it's too much, we need to, and, and look for them to be the advocate um, to really push me to recruit. Now, all that being said, I have in your original question, I don't think any of us does this well, and you said exactly what came to mind. This is the holy grail of, of a practicing radiologist, is, is that balance. And in some respects, the, the benchmarks we use, for example, the ARAD benchmarks, we're all being expected to be more productive at our institutions. Well, we're just driving the median numbers up. And so we're really having a lot of conversation at the chair level of, of you know, we're killing ourselves here. How do we look at these benchmarks in a productive way instead of just keep driving it up by per percentiles each year? Thank you so much. And Carolyn? I, I don't like to overstep my area of expertise, which is education. And so, you know, for accuracy, we do look, we give residents feedback, but we also, I think there's a big balance and a big debate actually from the AUR APDR side about how do we get residents to be faster and be able to tackle more volume while still being accurate. So I think it's a balance. And I think, you know, good feedback is always a good thing from the trainee side that we give them feedback, let them see where they're um, making mistakes. We have a peer review system for our PD, um, 
for a PD call cases, things like that. So make, I think in the trainee realm, accuracy versus speed, it's important they're getting feedback to where, and I think it's important to say, hey, you know, I noticed you took a lot more today and you made a lot more mistakes, maybe cut down by 25% or you're not taking enough and you're perfect. So maybe it's time to miss something once in a while and go a little faster. So I, I think it's different for trainees than for attendings, but I, I, I think it, there is an issue for both. Let's talk about specific subspecialties. I, I want to hear from each of you, and we'll just consider this a, 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 a random sampling as much as we can of three people. Uh, you know, this um, subspecialty specific issues that, that have come up in workforce, um, whether it's because they are getting much more attractive offers uh, in the private space or whether it's because remote work, for example, uh, has has driven them out of a more arduous, you know, on-site, uh, stressful, kind of patient-facing uh, uh, place in 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 the group. I mean, I think that's a very real issue, and I and I'm kind of curious how each of three of you face this because, as you know, there is this critical mass that can that can exist in any specific division. And once you start losing one or two of them, uh, you, it, it's just a downward spiral. Uh, so uh, I'd like to hear, I guess, Gloria, we can start with you if, if you have a specific thing you're dealing with or you've heard about. It. Um, um, if, if anyone's looking for a job, we do have some open positions that we are, are hiring for. But it, I, I think in terms of of not losing people and staying above that critical mass. Like, I, I, I definitely don't want to say anything that would like make me eat my words because it is such a hard hiring environment. I, I do know that you have the folks who come because they think the grass is greener at your organization. And you hope that that is true and you try at your best to make it true. You have the people who leave because they think the grass is greener elsewhere. And sometimes we hear that they were mistaken, and but you hope that's true for them too, right? You want them to land on their feet. They're your former colleagues. I think the main thing that you can do is make it clear what that there's a good match between between um, the expectations of the people that you bring in and what you offer. That if you are if you're at a place where you're say things like you really value expertise, that that's what we show every day. That that's what we consider prime is our expertise as opposed to just churning through a pile of studies um, and that we live by that as leaders and that when people feel that tension, we work with them to support how to, um, how to overcome those frictions that they are experiencing. Right, I find this unmute. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Gloria. And, and, you know, and not to be impolitic about this, I didn't want to put you all on the spot. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I will contribute a specific example from my experience, because I led recruitment at, at my group for several years. Um, breast imaging, for example, uh, women's imaging in general, I mean, it has been very difficult, I think, uh, because there are folks that have gone remote, um, or they have gone into uh, private practice or, um, you know, various other types of practice that uh, allow them to uh, get away from a, a traditional in-person, you know, patient-facing model. And whether that's better for their schedules or for they were facing burnout or some other issues, um, that has been one area in particular uh, where I think we've seen uh, a significant shift uh, due to remote work um and you know whatever uh pressures are out there on employers so um sherry i don't know if you want to go next i'm sure this is something you deal with much more acutely as the head of your department you know i have never seen the recruiting environment like it is now um, we've definitely had peaks and troughs over the years but what what has happened now that i've never seen is it it's lining up with the most recruiting in academics and in private practice at the same time. They're usually on kind of opposite timelines. So it's particularly challenging. And then lumped on that are these new models, which makes it even more complicated. I think the hybrid and remote models are interesting. I think we should embrace alternative scheduling, which includes some of these models. 
I think you have to be very careful with equity across sections and divisions, but importantly, within sections and divisions. And I'm watching from afar departments who are struggling um, because of the model they've adopted with their remote or their hybrid workers. And there, you have to be really careful when you start dabbling with differences in productivity, differences in salary, really important. And then differences in expectations. You have an individual who is remote and others are on site. That's, you know, they're, they're handling a lot of complicated things. So again, it, it's about consistency and transparency. And, and, and frankly, when it comes to recruiting, I pay attention to departments that are struggling because, you know, I, like Gloria said, if people think grass is greener, I'm going to take advantage of that. Thank you. I appreciate that candid answer. Um, Carolyn, do you have anything to contribute here? Because I think from the training side, you you probably do see what people are going into and what people are talking about in terms of what's out there. Absolutely. And actually, I ha I do see some trainees going into breast imaging despite it not being their favorite because they think it's more makes them more marketable. Um, I've definitely seen a few trainees say, hey, I, I could do fellowships in anything. I think I'm going to do fellowship in this because it'll make me more marketable. Um, and that just started. I actually, we had a long drought of people going into breast imaging and now some people are starting to do it. Is it the right reason? I don't know. I hope they're going to be happy um, doing that. But I definitely think that we see, we've seen a lot of people not doing ED fellowships anymore. There's so much need for ED people that you don't really need a fellowship in it anymore. And they'll take you, trust me. I mean, a lot of these places, everyone needs people in the ED. So, so I think we definitely see fellowship trends based on this. And I think we've seen it for a while. You know, there was a point where it was so unbelievably competitive to get into MSK and neuro. And now it's kind of waned a little because now it's sat the market saturated. So I definitely think you see waxes and wanes in what people go into, but I've definitely seen a little more of a push about wanting to be marketable. Even though there are so many jobs, I think they want to be marketable to the one they think is going to be the best job. Oh, there we go. You cut off just at the end, oh. but you were mentioning being marketable. Yeah. So I think I think that even though there's a lot of jobs out there, I was saying, I think the trainees now want to be marketable to the best jobs. You know, what can I yeah. do to get the best of them? Because there are so many and a lot of them are empty because they're not good jobs, right? Not all empty jobs are because they're not good jobs, but there are a lot of jobs out there that are empty for a reason. And I, and I think they want to make sure they're marketable to those um, more coveted jobs. Well, I sincerely appreciate that. Um, as expected, the, the time has just flown past and, and our time for the QA is, is all but up. Um, but uh, Carolyn, I especially appreciate you're giving them honest advice because, uh, and I used to tell med students this when when they were worried about AI, for example, driving out radiologists. Um, I used to say, look, you have a 30 plus career ahead of you, uh, you know, years and years. Uh, economic cy cycles will wax and wane, subspecialties will wax and wane. You you need to do the thing you enjoy, you sincerely enjoy. Don't worry about these short-term uh, cyclical things. So thank you for, for giving that sincere advice. Well, uh, I think that's about it. I, I want to thank everyone again uh, for participating, spending their time with us. And then I think uh, Bob is going to finish us off with some closing remarks. Thanks, everybody. Wow, what a super program tonight. I really appreciate on behalf of the Power Hour team, we'd like to express our thanks to all of our faculty for all this experience and insights and examples. Excellent program. So we would also like to thank the audience for attending tonight and learning about this. And you will be able to have a recording of this program uh, next week. So you can share this with members of your practice or friends from other practices. We hope you will do that, please. We also would like to have share your feedback with us and we'll be sending all the attendees tonight a survey along with the recording. Uh, it'll actually be next week, not later this week. Um, we also wanted to announce that the next program, Scaling Quality Improvement Within and Across Institutions, will be held in August, August 23rd. And if you want to register for this or any other upcoming Our Life Power Hour webinars, please go to the acr.org slash power hour 
website. Again, our great appreciation to our fabulous faculty tonight, and we wish everybody a, a better journey on wellness and these issues in your practice. Hopefully you've learned something tonight that will be helpful. Thank you and good night, everyone. Thank you.